You know, when I first became a single father, I remember having all of these feelings of of overwhelm and confusion, and there was just so much going on inside my head. I was struggling in my relationships with my older girls. I had all of these negative thoughts just bouncing around in my head that were telling me that I wasn't good enough or telling me that I I just didn't have what it took to take care of my kids well. And, you know, that reminds me of a story that really means a lot to me. I heard this a while back and I just wanted to share it. There was this farmer who was sitting on his front porch in a chair and he had a, a dog laying, lying next to him. And his friend walks up to him and he notices that the dog is is whining a little bit. And he asked the farmer, he said, well, what's going on with your dog? And the farmer says, oh, yeah, he's got a nail in his foot or he's got a nail in his paw. And the the friend says, well, how long has it been there? And the farmer says, oh, I don't know. It's been a long time. And then his friend asks him, he says, well, I don't understand. Why doesn't he just take it out? And his farmer says, well, you know, I guess it just doesn't hurt bad enough yet. And, you know, often I feel that that is our journey as, as men, as parents, as fathers, certainly as single fathers, we are going through life, walking around with these pains and with these, you know, kind of unsolved struggles. And we're like that dog walking around with a nail in its foot. And all we need to do is reach down and pull it out and let the healing begin and begin to, that's what we need to do in order to start moving forward. And, you know, for me, as I shared, that was the fractured relationship with my oldest daughters. And it was the the thoughts going on in my head. And maybe for you, it's similar, or maybe it's totally different. Maybe there are, maybe it's the struggle of a of strained marriage or, you know, an event that happened when you were a child that is just hanging with you. But until we are willing to actually reach down, pull that nail out, and begin the mending process, we will never become the person that we want to be. We will never have those relationships that we want with our children, and we will never step into that place that we were meant to be. Well, well hello, this is Don. And Gina. With Focused, Focused Healthy, Healthy Family. Family. And today, this is podcast number uh, 109, and we are talking to um, Rob Rohde, the single father coach and also the host of Business of Being a Dad. But before we get into that conversation, we want to take just a moment for our sponsor. And today we're talking about Ask the OT. This is a new program that we're starting where you're going to be able to connect via online, via phone call, Zoom, and ask questions about dealing with elderly parents or loved ones and navigating that journey and incorporating different components, dealing what if your parent has dementia and how are you supposed to get them to listen to you and follow through and you got to get them out of their house, but they're resistant and yet they can't follow what you're saying and understand. Or maybe you're wondering, does my dad have dementia? Why is he doing these funny things? What's going on? So we're building a community of support. My years of experience as an occupational therapist working primarily in adult and geriatric rehab and my background also with my family and helping my father navigate the journey of Parkinson's disease for the past 17 years and seeing his decline and his issues with dementia and all the families I've worked with over the years in working with this population. I want to help other people with this, all this information and experience that I've accumulated. And I know how disconnecting it to be. You're juggling multiple things at once. You're going to work. You're taking your kids to high school activities, and now you're helping your parents navigate it. Maybe it's a long distance thing. So come join us in our community. Yeah. Gina will be doing her first live kind of Q&A talk on April 2nd, 7 p.m. You can uh, find out more about it by going to our website, FocusedHealthyFamily.com. And actually, we have a little logo up there about Ask the OT, whether you can click on that, and you'll find out more information about how to get involved with this community that we're building. So 
check us out. And we look forward to you being there, asking your questions uh, starting April 2nd. But it's good to join now and get get involved with the community. There's a lot of resources up there for you to be able to uh, pull. And uh, we look forward to, to talking with you. Yes, feel free to send us questions you have now. And we're back. And today, again, we are in, uh, talking with Rob Rohde, a single father of five daughters who has overcome personal hardships. He understands the struggles that come with sudden parenting responsibilities. Balancing work, parenting, and social obligations can be overwhelming, making it challenging to connect deeply with your children. He has faced the same obstacles single fathers encounter, such as feeling uncertainty, inadequacy, and guilt. With 25 years of experience in pediatric health care and an MS in management and leadership, he offers a unique combination of personal and professional expertise to coach single fathers. He's developed a practical framework that helps single fathers overcome common challenges, gain clarity, and discover their purpose. By integrating daily habits and proven business principles, he created a secure home environment, improved his relationships with his daughters, and gained a deeper understanding of their individual needs and personalities. He has based his work on personal experience and education. His mission is to help other single fathers find their own transformation, create safe and joyful home environments, and build life-changing relationships with their kids. So, Rob, welcome. We're really glad to have you here. In fact, very, I'm, I'm excited because I'm a dad, <laughs> but I don't have that uh, single dad perspective. And it's really nice to get that on and get our audience to see that side of it. So welcome. Thank you so much. Hello, Don. Hello, Gina. I am, <laughs> I'm excited to be here and I'm excited to jump into this conversation and share it with your audience. We appreciate that. So maybe first off is just to kind of talk a little bit about your coaching and how you do it, um, how you're different in the fact that you're a single father coach. Sure. So, you know, I mean, coaching is coaching. And so there are aspects of it that are very similar. For instance, um, we always start off with really kind of identifying where the individual is at, what is their biggest struggle, the biggest biggest thing that is holding them back. And, you know, we have to start by addressing that. And of course, the another similarity is that we have a, a goal at the end. You know, we establish what is our vision for once this coaching is complete? Where does that father want to be? Maybe it's Maybe their focus is much more on their relationship with their kids, or maybe it's really on establishing these guardrails and and this balance, or maybe it's even personal joy and personal fulfillment because they feel that all they do is work and take care of their kids. <laughs> but we really identify what does the end look like for them? And then we, um, you know, go through the process of establishing the, the habits and the changes and provide tools and resources that allow them to get there. So I haven't answered your question yet because you <laughs> asked how it was different. That's how it's the same. But what makes it unique and what makes it different is that there are unique struggles and unique challenges that single fathers face. And, you know, I created this because when I was looking for solutions for myself, what I found was, you know, everybody talks about work-life balance or harmony or integration or whatever they choose to call it, but it's all kind of the same thing. And everybody talks about you know, the importance of connection and the importance of having solid relationships. But there wasn't anyone out there that I, I felt understood the significant differences in what a single father's life looks like and how work-life balance might look different for them than what it would look for, like for somebody else or how the, the challenge of having those close relationships is affected by their limited time with their kids. And, you know, those are just some for instances, but what makes it unique is that I fully understand because I have lived for 14 years, the um, life of a single father. And so I fully understand what it's like to both have a career and have good relationships with your kids and still looking for time to take care of yourself and to do that 
while still having this sense of joy and fulfillment and, you know, enjoying life. And I think that that's a big piece of it also. We can't just always be working and not have an opportunity to, to build into ourselves. Right. <laughs> yeah. If we're not taking care of ourselves, we're not doing a good job of taking care of other people. Absolutely. So, yeah, I, you know, I want to get into the, the uh, ideas that the, 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 what you went through and all. Uh, so maybe we could start if you could talk just a little bit about like how this all evolved for you, how, how you, how, how you got into this in the first place. And it was, I know uh, initially by through a divorce, you became a single parent. Maybe you could elaborate on that first. Yeah. So the, I, as you mentioned, I have five daughters and, you know, I love being a, a girl dad. I love having a large family. Um, I always have. And, you know, I was married to the girl's mom for 10 years and, you know, we reached a point where we went our separate ways. And when I first became a single father, you know, I talked about some of the thoughts going through my head, but the reality is I was really involved in my kids' lives as a married father. I was there Monday through Friday for the most part, Monday through Friday, I worked a lot of weekends. I worked night shifts. I rearranged my schedule so that my, uh, my wife at the time was able to finish school and, and I would be able to be there during, during the week with the kids. And so I felt like, you know what, this might not be that hard because I mean, I, I'm not naive. Divorce is hard mm -hmm. and there's a lot of pain associated with that. And divorce is hard for kids. And it wouldn't be, I wouldn't have integrity if I didn't recognize that. But I did feel like I would be able to handle it because I already had that solid relationship with the kids and I was already pretty well involved in their lives. Um, I did have some struggles with my older daughters who were twins and were teenagers at the time. Hmm. And so mm -hmm. those kind of beginning challenges that we had really grew and became much worse during that divorce process. And so that was a huge, huge challenge. But the bigger thing is that as a single father and as a new single father, there was this overwhelming kind of weight of responsibility that I felt that I wasn't expecting. It just felt different knowing that I didn't have another person there to kind of share the responsibility with during the time when I had the kids. Um, and, you know, one of the, the unique challenges is that when you become a single father or a single parent through the means of divorce, then you're going through this adversarial process within the court systems and within the custody rights and, and figuring out all the finances and what to do with the house and all of those things. And it's pretty difficult for most people to go through from this process of having this you versus them sort of mentality, unfortunately, during a lot of those proceedings to then be having a solid co-parenting relationship. And that is a big challenge. And so that was one of the struggles that we had. And I admit that, but I, one thing that, that I did was I committed to not talking negatively about the girl's mom in front of them. And you know, sometimes that was difficult, but I, I did that. And over time we were able to work out our differences and, and, you know, really develop a co-parenting relationship that we felt like was respectful towards each other and was putting the kids first. And so that was our goal. And we were able to kind of settle into that. And then kind of, as you, as you mentioned, it did feel like we had help you know, it did feel like we were in each other's corner a little bit in terms of how we were raising them in terms of coming to agreements on, on big decisions and, and things like that. And so, so that initial period of time was really rough. And then we kind of settled into a place where we were able to work together um, for a while anyway. Well, and then it, then it moved into a whole different uh, scenario for you because um your, your wife, wife passed and um so i'm kind of curious as to 
you know, you had a situation where you were a single dad, but you had a co-parent. You had somebody, at least somebody there as support. Maybe not while they were the girls were with you, but you know, there there was. And now you're going into a place where you're single, alone. How how did that? What what kind of changes does that do for you both emotionally and and just practical practically? Yeah, it changed a lot. I mean. For my specific story, it wouldn't be a full story if I didn't share the circumstances around how she passed, because that led into the challenges that we had. So and without going into all of the details, but just to give the audience a, a general idea, um, there we had reached a point where we were in a good spot as co-parents, and then... Um, she had some she had some struggles that she was dealing with she was in a a relationship that was poor and there were some allegations against her boyfriend um, and her complicity in the potential abuse of my daughters yeah. and that led to this series of court events and counseling appointments and victims advocacy um conversations and all and police involvement that led to the arrest of her and her boyfriend. Mm -hmm. They were later released on bail and following her release on bail, she uh, committed suicide. Oh, wow. And so that's how the girls lost their mom. Mm -hmm. And she was, there was drug involvement and things like that leading up to that. And I, I think she just wasn't without trying to, to play uh, therapist here. I think she was just struggling with all of the things that were going on and was trying to cope with that in an unhealthy way. Um, but I, I'm bringing that up because the loss of a parent due to suicide is one of the most difficult right. things for a child to face. And at that time, my younger girls were ages, I want to say eight to 14. Mm -hmm. Um, the three youngest, the old, my oldest twins at that point were in their early twenties. So, so there were so many challenges there. And so it wasn't just the logistics of trying to figure out how to parent alone right. and, you know, really without support, but it was also trying to make sure that the kids had what they needed. Um, even myself to a point, although if I'm being honest, I put that on the back burner for years, um, but trying to figure out what it was that the girls needed, trying to make sure that they had the the support and the counseling and, you know, all of the other things. And it, there's only one way to say it. It was a, a horrible, horrible few years for all of us. Mm -hmm. um, there's, there's no way to sugarcoat it, mm -hmm. but I will say this, that we already had counselors in place prior to this. And so we already had a somewhat of a foundation in place prior to this. And I think that that looking back, I think that that allowed the process to go more smoothly than it otherwise would have. Um, but there was still so much pain and so much for the girls to, to work through. And, you know, whenever I, I talk about this, I, I like to be honest and admit that, it's not fair for me to talk about this as if, if we worked on this in past tense, because this is still a part of our everyday life, mm -hmm. but the girls are, are really in a, a solid, healthy um, place where they are essentially thriving in their day-to-day -day lives right now. But there are situations that come up that trigger this and um, that's going to happen for the rest of their lives. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That adds a whole <laughs> A whole lot of different components there of trauma that they've experienced and um yeah that suddenness of and just the aspect of taking your own life that um i can only imagine those challenges and differently for different ages of kids right it, how they process it and understand it um, yeah um, and when when they are really able to process it I, I will say that my daughter who was 14 at the time for instance she's in a completely different place as far as the things that she has worked through. She's now 21. Um, then say my daughter who was eight, you know, and, mm -hmm. and so it might be several more years before she's fully able to work through some of those things. Um, some of the big things even. Mm 
Yeah. And I think it's great that, you know, you had the therapy in place already. I'm sure that made quite a difference just, you know, knowing we've had kids, you know, our kids are therapists, work with therapists and just building that rapport and them being comfortable in that situation. So, um, well, I was curious as to where you were able to find support that you needed. Uh, you know, you've mentioned therapy, which is one, but were there other avenues that you found support from family members or friends or other resources? Absolutely. And support comes in so many different ways. And, you know, there's, I, for this specific event, I would not have gone through it without having counselors in place, but, um, I will say that I am so thankful for individuals within our community that we hadn't spoken with for years, you know, maybe parents of friends from when the kids were young, who just heard about what had happened and reached out and showed up and, you know, took the kids for a couple of, uh, for a few hours to like do a craft or some painting or something like that. And to just get their mind off of it and get things going. Um, and so I just want to express my gratitude for individuals that we had that helped with that. So we had people within our community, our, our neighborhood, we've, we've lived in the same house, the girl's whole life. And so they, you know, people know who we are, where we live, <laughs> stuff like that. But also, um, we had family. Uh, so the girl's mom, her family and my family both stepped in and did whatever they could to, to provide support. And, and they wouldn't have even called it support, just being there and giving the extending the, uh, the environment. So I tried, I have always tried to create a safe and secure environment within my home and, you know, our extended families have expanded that for the daughter so that for my daughter, so that they can go other places and still feel that same sense of security and safety and love. And that was amazing. And then for myself personally, I talked about how outside of just some basic counseling, um, I didn't actually deal with a lot of these, these issues and the things that I was feeling from that until these last couple of years. Mm -hmm. So it was a good four, you know, that was six years ago when that happened. So it was a good four or five years later. Um, but I did have a group of, there's this group of six of us. So five other men that I have gotten together with on a regular basis for over 20 years. And it all started off with this fun kind of fantasy football league where, <laughs> where we, um, then would, then we ended up in all different parts of the country. And so we have had this we had had it set up where we would meet in a certain location, a different location for, you know, like four days a week, once a year. And it just so happens with like a couple weeks after some of this news broke, um, not her actual death, but some of the abuse allegations, I was, it was my weekend with this, these guys. And that was huge for me to have that support, um, from those men that even though we don't see each other often, I know that I mean, they would, you know, run through a wall for me and for my kids. And, and so, uh, it was just nice having those men in my life to, to bounce my, my ideas and my feelings off of. Sure. And at that particular time too, yeah, you mentioned not being able to really process what you went through till much later. Cause I imagine initially it was just all about your kids and, and, and helping your girls deal with things that, you know, your own issues kind of got put on the back shelf. It sounds like, um, yeah. Understandably I, so. I know that's unique to hear, right? No man does that. No, <laughs> no parent does that, right? <laughs> yeah. No. Well, it it sounds like you've just like the last year or so, you've you've been able to breathe, uh, you know, in a way, you know, to be able to like, okay, now they're in good place. I I've got them set up. Now it's time to turn in and go in here, you know, um, and it. It sounds, I have to say, I admire the fact that you were able to go to that group in the midst of all of that. Because I, I know for myself, I would probably been going, oh, I probably shouldn't go, you know, because of all the stuff going on. But you, and I think that's great, taking care of, that you, you took a step out and took care of yourself, which I think is is wonderful. Um, you, you talk a lot about the misconceptions of, of single fatherhood. Um, 
maybe we can talk a little bit about that. Yeah, this is something that I'm actually I'm I'm pretty passionate about because there I think that there are a lot of misconceptions out there and you know there's a lot of people still throw out the term, you know, deadbeat dads and and fathers who um you know, fathers who just aren't there for their kids and I understand where these terms come from and where that uh where that comes from. But I just believe that there is a lot larger group of men out there that have a strong desire to be a a part of their kids' lives mm. and that are willing to do whatever it takes in order to to do that. Um, but a couple of misconceptions that I'll just throw out there real quick. One of them is that men are not as capable as women or fathers are not as capable of as mothers of providing a nurturing environment for their kids. And I think that there are, that it might come more naturally. In fact, I know that it comes more naturally for more for the majority of women than it does maybe for men. However, that discounts the opportunity for growth and the opportunity for intentional action. And I think that as parents, when we have a desire to do something and our motivation is our kids and their well being. Once we know what it is that we need to do, we are fully capable of stepping into that place and growing and learning and, you know, maybe even leaning on other women who have done this well for years and asking for their support and their guidance in that. And so I, I don't like that misconception because I don't like any misconception that eliminates the opportunity for growth. Sure. Um, but the, the other misconception <laughs> is just in general that a mom is more important in the lives of their kids than a father. And uh, I struggle with that one as well, because I think that both parents have a, an equal responsibility and an equal impact in the lives of their kids. And all of us are making an impact. All of us as fathers, as single fathers, whether we are in our kids' lives or we have chosen not to be in it, or we aren't allowed to be in it and we're doing whatever we can to to get to that place we are making an impact in the lives of our kids the question is what kind of an impact is that mm -hmm. but we are absolutely making an impact in the lives of our kids yeah. well you know you, what you what you're talking about is something i talk to i i work with a lot of parents and individuals and all and a lot of times parents come into into the and they're like they're so worried about how they've screwed up their kids because of their mistakes and their issues and it sounds like you're doing exactly what I talk about with them is you you're showing them that there are problems and there are mistakes that are made but you're showing them how to get through them and you're giving them a wonderful example of how they can then in the future or whenever they may run into that same issue. Well, dad made it through it. I can make it through it. And I think that's wonderful. I think that's uh, builds like resiliency. The, yeah. Yeah. Um, the other thing is you bring up, you know, that dads are not as capable as moms, that kind of misconception. And we, on a different note, I went back to work full time when our first child was born. <laughs> and so Don was the stay at home dad growing a business while working at home. And um, so he kind of had that experience of being the primary person at home with our son. And yeah, you joined a group of women, you met them at the library yeah. and met up with these moms once a week and hanging out with the kids. And there were, there was another dad that was involved because he was a pilot. So he'd be home at times and very involved, but you know, just you joined another group of, of stay at home dads at that time. Yeah. Yeah, it, it it was it. You know, I think you're right. I think that things are changing because I know, you know, I've always been, tried to be very involved. In fact, uh, you know, I went into my own practice, my own business, uh, so I could be home because I was originally I was in sales. So I traveled. I'd be gone all week, and I'd do that three weeks out of a, a month. And I was like, when we started talking about having kids, I said, I don't want to be the dad that's never around. Or you know. So yeah, I I get that. I, I made a big effort in doing that, and you know that I, when she talked about that, I remember the first day that she went to work, and she came home, and I was like sitting in a chair, and I was like, 
oh, you know, and, and I looked at it, I said, I didn't even get to take a shower. A shower. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was just, you know, so, so it was, was a, uh, it was a challenging, but, you know, I found she, she breastfed. So she had a bond with our kids right off the bat. And I didn't know how to do that, but I found my bond was on the changing table. <laughs> You know, I used to have a lot of fun with my kids on the changing table so that I was able to make that bond. And I, I again, it's I think that's where men have problems. They they don't know how to find that bond. And I think it's very important to find a way to get that bond um, and being open, for, like you say, and and willing to to want to do that, to be there for your kids is very important. Yeah. And our culture kind of has this misconception, like you're talking about that, you know, the mom's more important, that the mom's more involved, which, you know, is kind of crazy to me. And, and... So, oh, did I freeze? I don't know. There you are. You're back. <laughs> the misconception, you know, that the moms are the ones that are more involved. And, you know, I was thinking about the things that you're telling us. Um, the dads who are involved, that doesn't get the media attention. Those aren't the stories we hear. That's not what's portrayed typically in, in movies and other events that, you know, you hear about, like you said, the deadbeat dad, but yet there are probably more that, you know, and uh, uh, more, more dads that are really involved. And um, it's important to, like you're talking about it too, that it's. Um, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I love your guys's. I love your story, Don, about finding a way to connect with your child that is unique to you. I mean, that's that's awesome. That's a great story and a great example for people. But one of the reasons why I like to bring up some of these misconceptions is because, see, this is the the bigger problem with some of these misconceptions to me is that it becomes easy for us as men to start to believe them. And we can allow ourselves when things start going wrong, when we try to connect with our kids and it doesn't go well, when we see our kids running to their moms for that nurturing kind of kind of support because we're not providing it for them, it becomes very easy for us to absorb those words that we've heard before and believe them to be true. And we have to fight against that. You know, we have to to realize that. You know, this is a journey, right? This is not a, a sprint. It's a marathon. It is a, a long process. And, you know, the way that results are made for all of us is through consistency. And so you have to, like, give it time and be consistent. And you will start to see the, the results change. I mean, for sure. But um, I think that it's very easy when we start hearing things over and over again. And there are things that support maybe what we're thinking about ourselves already you know it becomes easy to just allow that to become who we are and how we view ourselves well it's interesting because you I, I just listened to your i think it's your latest podcast it was about on mindset and i am a mindset coach I, I work for a naturopathic doctor and and my job is to help people going through their healing process to not get stuck and what you're talking about is exactly, I, I was listening going, yeah, yep, 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 okay, yeah, that's what I, you know, um, because it, if you get that mindset and that you're failing as a dad, it, it's, a, it's a set that grows and, and develops and just keeps getting worse and worse if you don't stop and change that mindset. And that, that's, I think, what you're talking about there, you know, as yeah. dads. Well, once we see something, it's kind of like uh, I've worked with a, a, a basketball player one time and they made one bad shot and it triggered within them. Every time they'd go up to make a shot, that that message would play off. Oh, I screwed up. I'm a, I'm a screw up as a, a player. I, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do this. And it, it just blossomed into that belief and it became a true belief for them and we had to change that. Yeah, that's true. I mean, I've, you've seen that a lot. I've, we've seen that a lot with, with athletes or with us, you know, right in, in everyday life, but I appreciate your feedback, um, on that episode, especially from a, 
a mindset expert, you know, <laughs> that means a lot. I, I wouldn't I, stretch it that far, but because uh, I still go through it myself, you know, and I, I, I work, I also, I'm a tapping, I don't know if you're familiar with EFT or tapping, but I'm, that's where I build my practice on. And I've, I work on it every day because it, it's, it's just something that um, was so ingrained, I think, even as a small child. And that's what I, I see a lot. We get these, uh, our parents do sometimes do things that are, are not intentional, but we take them in the wrong way. And then they become so, uh, uh, kind of the bricks of our foundation. And then as we go through life, things go along that just bump them up, bump them up, bump them up until they get to be over, overdone, over, you know. And so we really have to, to work on it. And I find men are, are my hardest clients because they, they don't, they've been taught not to deal with their emotions, not to deal with how they're feeling. Not, and that has to change too. Absolutely. It, you know, I don't consider myself a mindset expert in, in any regard, but I, I recognize, um, I have an awareness and I recognize that we need to, that needs to be a part of this journey for single fathers because that is a big issue that can hold us back. And so by, I think by simply having an awareness of, of how this could be affecting us and kind of having that as like the general umbrella of, of, you know, all the work that we're doing is to kind of just circle back to that and make sure that that's not holding us back, that that's not causing us to sell ourselves short or to think small or to, um, maybe give up prematurely. You know, I think that it's at least important to, to recognize that and have that as a kind of an overarching portion of the work I do with dads. Well, that awareness is the first, I call it the first step. If you can become aware, you know, when I'm at the this doctor's office, I talk about these people come in, they're aware of something going on in their body that isn't working right. And I feel like my job and everybody's job really is really to become aware of what's going on up here. And like I said, that's the first step. Yep. And so that kind of segues into my next kind of question is, I think you talk about, if I, if I remember right, in, in this, that you, the, you take uh, a father through some steps in your coaching process. Maybe we can talk a little bit about what you do in that coaching practice and how you, these steps or this process that you have for helping fathers. Sure. Yeah. So I, I talked a little bit about the mindset thing, but then also a big piece of what I, I do, um, you, you brought up in the beginning, but I, during my journey, during my growth journey, where I um, was just learning everything I could about, about leadership and parenting and productivity and habit creation and all of that and leadership, I identified this unique relationship or this strong correlation, I should say, between leading a family and leading in your business between established taking us how you could take established business principles and perhaps apply them in your personal life in a way that is maybe unique and tweaked slightly in order to kind of up level your your parenting and so that is a big part of what i do that's why i call it the business of being dad and so kind of a for instance for that um what i like to to kind of ask people is like Let's say you're within the business space. You have um, you have something, a goal that either you have set or somebody has put upon you, a major goal, a major project, and you have identified that this goal or this project is what's going to catalyze you from where you are to where you want to be. It's going to make a significant impact in your life or in your career. How do you treat that? What do you do in that situation? right? You, you dedicate resources towards it. You block off time every single week to make sure you're working towards it. You establish metrics to make sure that you are heading in the right direction. Maybe you bring in additional resources to help you, or if you have skills you need to learn or knowledge you need to acquire, 
Maybe you, you spend time learning it or you bring in someone else to teach it to you, to help guide you during that process. But the point is you are intentional in how you go about meeting that goal. And I, I just wonder if we took that same level of intentionality within goals and things within our personal life or our family life that we have identified as this is important. The, I need to work on this if I want to get to where I want to be, or I need this to occur if I want to have the relationship that I'm longing for with my daughters. What would the results be? You know, and those, those proven leadership principles absolutely apply because it is impossible to be an effective father without being an effective leader. And I could say an effective parent without being an effective leader. And so um, that's a that's the methodology that I use. It's almost everything that I do. We try to circle it back to things that most people already know, things that maybe they're already doing within their life, but they're doing it in another part of their life, not within their family life. And we take that and we incorporate it into their their goals and their habits and what they what they are doing in order to make progress within their their um kind of the vision that they've set for themselves. And so that's kind of the methodology that I use and the the pieces that we walk through specifically are going to be unique depending on the individual and what their their goals are, but something that is a part of all of our all of our journeys or all of the coaching clients that I work with is going to be identifying that biggest obstacle that's holding them back, establishing their vision, identifying the single top priority that will that they need to tackle what I call the lead domino that will make everything else either easier or maybe even unnecessary if they if they tackle that. And then we absolutely talk through work-life integration and stronger rela relationships with their kids and establishing boundaries um, and and habits. And so that's a, those are some of the pieces that we talk about. And it's, it's a much more structured process than what I'm explaining right now or articulating <laughs> right now, but it's also meant to be fully customizable to the, the individual client's mm -hmm. desire, mm -hmm. desires and, and unique circumstances. That makes a lot of sense. You know, talking about taking business principles and applying it in relationships with your family and, um, we do that in the aspect of communication. We focus a lot on communication and, you know, we think about how you communicate with coworkers and friends and why is it that we communicate so differently with our children and, and realizing that, you know, I, I say respect is a two way street. We want our children to respect us, but if we're not talking to them in a respectful way, you know, and we're expecting them to um, respond to us. So yeah, that, that definitely resonates with us of taking those principles and, yeah, with setting goals. And if we want to build a better relationship with our child, you know, what are we doing to get to that point? Um, um, <clears throat> just like you would with the work project. So yeah, I love that. It just makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I was thinking the same thing because we we, um, we started out with this a book called How to Talk So Kids Will Listen and Listen So Kids Will Talk. And it was, we were teaching parents for, for kids and, and really it was kind of geared towards uh, younger kids. But we, I started using it in my business practices because the concepts were so solid. So yeah, it was we're kind of doing the 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 reverse, taking what we learned as a, for for kids and putting it into adults. You know, like a, we're moving into a lot of the um, uh, sandwich generation, senior care parents that are kind of trapped in between raising kids and taking care of uh, seniors. So there's a lot of similarities between the two. And uh, yeah, communication is a is a huge part. Well, it's a huge part of anxiety too. It it, it makes a huge difference in anxiety, um, either raising anxiety or lowering it, depending on how you how you respond, how you communicate with somebody. So that was kind yeah. of a tangent we went off on there, but uh... no, but I mean, absolutely, and I I think that there are the softer leadership skills that most people don't spend time. It's maybe not the first thing you think of when you think of what are our leadership practices, but I mean, the most effective leaders, in my opinion, have the ability to engage their teams, to engage mm -hmm. their departments, to engage their organization. They have the ability to allow their organization or their team members to feel heard and valued and seen. 
They include them in part of the decision making. They, you know, look for opportunities to recognize them both individually and before their peers. And those are all aspects of parenting are all aspects of leadership that we could absolutely incorporate into our parenting, right? We will become more effective leaders of our families if we have the ability to engage our kids well, to connect with them, to lead through connection and lead through engagement. And in fact, I, I person, personally believe that connection is the, that is the lead domino for effectiveness within a family because when your kids know that you care about them, that you love them, that you know them on a deep level and that they can be themselves and be fully loved around you, everything else we want to do becomes so much easier. You know, the, the protection piece, the, the curfews, the guardrails, all of that becomes easier when we're coming from a place, a foundation of having these strong connected relationships with our kids. Same thing with trying to instill values in them, trying to teach them things, trying to get them to do new things, trying to provide them with responsibility and accountability. When we're coming from that place of love and connection, all of that becomes so much easier. Yeah. Well, I, I think what it, uh, I think Zig Ziglar says uh, they don't care what you know until they know what you, that you care, something like that anyway. Um well, one uh, kind of just a kind of a last thought here. Is there one any advice that you would give to a father that's maybe heading into that single parenting place um, or anything else that you might want to add in here uh, to get out to our audience? Yeah, thank you for asking. You know, I I think that this this aligns with what we were just talking about. But I think this fits for single fathers and it's it's fits for all all parents. And I'm going to talk about culture for a second. I believe that the health of an organization can be found in the culture of that organization. And I believe that the health of a family can be found within the culture of that family. And nobody really thinks about establishing a culture within their home mm -hmm. or a culture within their family. But I would say, that if you are a if you are a father who has an established family already or you're a single father just stepping into that space or you're trying to figure out how to turn around the environment within your house or within your family i would focus only on one thing establishing that culture and establishing that culture means you know first identifying what do you want your what do you want your home to be to your kids how do you want to be known? How do you want to be recognized? What do you want people to feel when they walk into your home? And I want my kids to feel safe. I want them to feel comfortable. I want them to feel comfortable as individuals. And I want them to feel comfortable bringing in other people so that other people feel comfortable when they're there. I want them to know that they can be themselves fully and completely. And I want them to have this sense of, of, being a part of something that our family is something worth being a part of because this culture is what allows your kids to, it's what keeps your kids coming back. Once they reach that stage of life that, that some of mine have reached, you know, where they're adults and they no longer have to show up for dinner if they don't want to, mm -hmm. they no longer have to go to dad's. It's a choice, mm -hmm. but if it's a culture where they feel where they enjoy themselves and they feel safe and they feel loved and they feel secure and connected, they're going to keep coming back. Sure. And so I, I would focus on setting up your culture. Sure. I never thought about it in that aspect before. Um, but that makes sense to me because we've done <laughs> that without realizing, you know, just giving it that term. We have a 26 year old son and he's got his own house, but he lives close to us. And he, you know, we do get together for family family time and game night and things. And just, you know, looking back over the years, it's um, reaffirming. <laughs> well, he still calls in a couple times a week, checks in with you and yeah. says, just want to see how you're doing, what's going on. You know, it's, it's a nice feeling um, the, the, that they want to be here, that they're, you know, they don't reach that, but they didn't reach the teen years where they were hating us and wanting to get the heck out of this house and, you know, kind of thing. They, now, somewhat, we we want we want them to move on at some point, but uh, we really like the fact that they 
they love being here. They want to be here. They want to be part of it. So And I think it's that foundation of the connection that we established with them, you yeah, know. the relationship like we talked about. So Yeah. well, uh, Um Rob, we there's how a lot else here. We could uh probably talk a long time on this subject. Uh but our time is probably running a little close to the edge here. So How else can people reach you and find out about you and Yeah, thank you for asking. So, you know, I feel like the best way to the way that I would like for people to reach me is to just check out my podcast. It's called The Business of Being Dad. And the reason why I like to send people there is because I think it gives people an idea to it gives people an opportunity to get an idea of what I'm all about. You know, is Rob someone I want to listen to? Is he do I do I can I relate to what he's saying or, you know, Do I want to know more? And within the show notes of each of my podcasts, I have links in there. And so people can go from there to my website. They can go from there to, they can shoot me an email from there. And I occasionally will offer freebies as well to um, just tools and resources to help, help dads on their journey. That's So great. It's I would so love great. for people to check it out and Mm -hmm. subscribe and let me know what they think. Sure. And you will share that link in our, our notes here. And we so appreciate you being here. You know, we've delved into some topics that we don't know very much about, and we appreciate having you on here to be able to reach out, you know, to single dads and just adding that component of, you know, another aspect of parenting that um, applies to so many people. Yeah. Thanks for being very vulnerable and being able Yes, to tell and your sharing. story too. That Mm-hmm. that that's something that's tough for dads to do sometimes too. And I think it's great that you do that. So thank you for being a part of this. Thank you guys. We have to, we have to model the behaviors we want others to, to do. Right. Exactly. So <laughs> Exactly. vulnerability Exactly. is a piece of that, but thank It you guys is. so much for having me. I've really enjoyed this conversation. Well, thank you. And to our audience, I hope you've enjoyed the podcast today. Please check out the notes to learn more about Rob and to find out about our other podcasts and the other programs that Don and I are providing at Focused Healthy Family. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Let us know your questions and, and topics that you have, like the interview today with Rob. We could get into so much more conversation along these lines. So let us you know, reach out to us and share with us that information. Also look for our, our latest thing is Ask the OT, where you get an opportunity to be part of a community uh, that talks to Gina, our occupational therapist, about uh, the senior population and the caregiving that goes on there and any questions you have about that. So look for Ask the OT. Uh, you can go to our website and find the information there. And remember, how you speak to your children today shapes their future and yours.